Hello. Today is the 30th of June 2022. My name is Norbert Mein, and I'm here today with the eminent musicologist, a Canadian and Danish, and now living in Copenhagen, John Bergsagel. Hello, John. We are going to talk about your friend and colleague, the composer Egon Welles, today. But before we go into that, we should start with a little bit of information about you. So could you just tell us a bit about your own background? Well, as you said, I'm Canadian. I'm Canadian of Norwegian descent and was born out on the prairies of Saskatchewan in 1928. And there the um, uh, Norwegian Lutheran Church built a, a, a college which was affiliated with the University of Saskatchewan and my father, who was a pastor, was the principal of that college. And how did you first uh, encounter music and discover your love for music? Yes, well, that I can't really say. But my mother was very artistic in many branches and she was also musical. So I would like to say that my mother made me a musician, but my father made me a historian because he that was his field. And uh, it happened that in this little town, for all its shortcomings, it had a music teacher. And I was sent to learn the piano before I can remember. And that, in fact, was the only regular music training I had for some years because we left that town when I was eight. So I'd had some training before that time. And then I didn't have regular training until we eventually moved to Winnipeg during the war. So the yeah, there, there, there were itinerant musicians that had a hand, but mainly it was the foundation that was laid then, and I had a certain a certain capacity for it, and uh, my mother helped, and uh, well, I should, if I may, uh, it's nothing about, I mean, <laughs> it, I don't want to distract the, the tenor of this discussion, but <clears throat> there, out on the prairies of Saskatchewan, as I have implied, there was no reg regular training, but one of the lonely farmers had put an advertisement in the paper <coughs> and it was answered by a lady from the, who had graduated from the Riga Conservatory. And she agreed to come with if he would pay for, <coughs> for her grand piano, which he did. And my father, when he had meetings with various Norwegian communities, there was one place where, which was near that farm. And so when we came to that place, he would say, well, you can take the car and go over and have a lesson. I was only about 10 or 11 at the time, so it was a little bit risky, but there weren't many other cars on the road at that time. In fact, there weren't very many roads. But I was allowed to, ha I was allowed to learn to drive at the same time as I learned to play the piano. And then I didn't have regular training until we eventually moved to Winnipeg during the war. You then went into music research. Um, how did that happen? Oh, that was another story. When we came to Winnipeg, I got really good training there. I, I was uh, the pupil of a very good teacher. And I did be, began to do a great deal of playing and singing. And I had the good fortune to meet a really good composer who came to lecture at the university. And he was an American composer. And his he went from Winnipeg to teach at Cornell University. And he wrote from Cornell and said, why don't you come to Cornell and study composition with me? And incidentally, there's a good musicologist here. That was, of course, the very well-known Donald Grote. Well, I did. Uh, and I, well, Donald asked me to send some papers, I did. He accepted me. And I went really with the idea of studying composition. But uh, I couldn't see how one could make an honest living as a composer. And I began to see that there was the possibility of a career in musicology, which allowed me to do everything I like to do, play the piano, sing, conduct choirs, do research, continue my historical studies, liturgy, all, theology. All these things were a possibility uh, as a musicologist. 
after the war in, in 1954, you came to Oxford to do some research, and that's when you first met Egon Velez. Yes, I came in, I came in 53, in the autumn of 53, and since I had, I thought I had the opportunity to do so, I went to the Royal Academy. I registered at the Royal Academy and did composition with Howard Ferguson. And I went, I moved up to Oxford because my brother was there and Donald Grout had written to Oxford about me so that Westrup and Vellis were very kind and received me and incorporated me into the activities of the music faculty there. Could you describe your first um, meeting with Egon Vélez? Oh, yes. Um, well, uh, uh, it was probably the same impression that I always had of him. I, uh, a very distinguished man, very kind man, um, a very easy man to meet. He a smiling a, a face and a, a genuine interest in the people he was dealing with. A simple man in many ways. I, that that's perhaps the most uh, characteristic thing about him was that he he was enormously distinguished and very learned and very talented, and had a grand already a distinguished history, but he he had an air of simplicity about him that uh, made it very pleasant to be in his company. How did that develop, and how did your work in Oxford bring you in closer? contact with him. I knew him mainly uh, for his work in Byzantine music and um, I think this was rather important in the long run because he quite liked to talk about it because, well I, I, I don't know exactly, but because it was a Scandinavian connection I think because of his, because of the headquarters of the of Monumenta being in Copenhagen and so on. But um, it was in 1959 when I came back it, uh, to do further research, but in a different field, that uh, I got to know him much better. And I was, take, I was given a position in the, in the Faculty of Music and uh, he would <laughs> He would quite regularly call after breakfast and say, are you going into the faculty? And I would I had a car and I would say, yes, well, you wouldn't mind coming by and picking me up, would you? And so we, we this was a regular thing. He would call, I would go by, we would have a nice chat in the car. So your friendship with Egon Velez started um, through a ride-sharing arrangement uh, in the mornings. Um, so could you describe your own research and activities in the university at the time, in, and especially in, in, the, in the 50s, in, the, in 59 and after that, and also um, what did you learn about his work in the university at that time? When I came in 53, 54, I, I was working on, and I think this may have some significance, I was, I was doing a dissertation on Vaughan Williams, and Vaughan Williams had, of course, had a, a role in helping Vélez during the when he was in the internment camp, and I think went uh, interceded on his behalf, and so Vélez was was very keen on on Vaughan Williams, and but when I came back in '59, I had moved backwards in time, and I was really interested in uh, Tudor church music, in uh, Renaissance and later in medieval music and um, that was really why almost immediately together with Frank Harrison I started the series Early English Church Music which still goes on I'm happy to say and I uh, and of course enjoyed all the advantages of the Bodleian Library and which was quite rich and worked there in that time and Egon had, was a general editor for a, a, a series in, which included Frank Harrison's book on music in medieval Britain. That's why um, my, my research at that time was in a different field from what I had begun with. What sense did you get of Vélez's position in the university and the respect people had for him? Well, no question about respect. Uh, his position was 
I'm not quite, uh, was not even quite clear to me. He, he was retired and yet he wasn't. I mean, he was active. Um, some of my own students were getting tutorials from him in opera, for example. I think that was the thing that he did. He didn't, as far as I know, ever um, run a course on Byzantine music, but he, he did a lot on opera. And he, uh, his, his position was, to some extent, that of the elder statesman. Uh, I, he had been one of the architects of the music faculty, I think, in, uh, in the late, after the war. He was the logical person to, to consult on the subject. I'm not sure that he and Jack Westrup uh, saw musicology quite the same, and yet they were, both of them, active in bringing the honor school into, into existence. I, I, I don't really know about that, if there was internal conflict or dis dissension about it. I, I never was aware of it, but it, it occurred to me that it could be there because Egon had the old Guido Adler approach to, to musicology. In fact, the fifth edition of Grove's Dictionary the article on musicology, which was actually quite a new concept at that time, I don't think I even knew the word musicology in my youth, but it, in, in the 19, that was 1955, I think, the fifth edition, and Egon wrote the whole article on it, and of course it's based on the system of Adler and so on. The sixth edition, that is the New Grove, it, that came out in 1980, has an article by Vincent Duckles and half a dozen other people. It, it took a real team to do the article on musicology by that time, 30, 25 years later. And uh, I, I think the, it's interesting to think that how musicology has changed in that time. Well, the Honor School, I think the first class started in 1950 and graduated in 1953, the first group in which Robert Layton, I mentioned, um, who was, Egon's biographer in the New Grove uh, was one of his pupils there and knew him much better than I do from the pedagogical point of view. Um, the, he, he, he was always viewed with respect, uh, with kindliness. Well, he was himself a very kind man. And um, <laughs> he just was there and was part of the Oxford scene. I, 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 don't, I don't know really what, if, if he, well he had, oh, I should not ig ignore the fact that he was also a, a magnet that attracted people from, mainly from the Balkan area, from the um, Central European area, who wanted to work on Byzantine music, but these were really his pupils. They, they came because he was there, and that was, of course, through the university too. There were university facilities for them. Some of them he actually referred to me in, with, referred to, with reference to Gregorian chant, which, I, which was part of what I was doing. So I had some contact and I knew most of his pupils. That was also a, a kind of a bond between us, that uh, we, uh, uh, we were friends with the same foreign students, so to speak. Um, I, I, of course, I had all my own students, and he, I don't know whether he had any arrangements with, with colleges for tutorials. I doubt it, really, except for these uh, specialists, these special students. Um, and and the, the, these, it, it was almost as if Monumenta Musica Byzantina was um, <laughs> an adjunct of the University of Oxford, I think, at that time, because of, because of Aegon. What about his personal situation, his house, his, his, did you meet his wife? Was he there? Was he often, uh, did he travel a lot? Uh, what did you think? I don't know that he traveled a lot. Uh, I certainly met his wife, a lovely woman, 
a very talented woman, uh, an art historian and uh, a very handsome woman and a, a strong personality. And there was a, a strong equal, e equality between the two of them too. They had high regard for each other's academic uh, abilities. She didn't have the advantage of an academic position, but she did do research. She did some writing and she did uh, um, was in contact with a, an, another group of friends, I think. But um, I don't remember that Egon traveled very much, but when, it th when things got easier in the 60s, uh, they would take summer holidays in, in Austria. And I, I, I visited them in Austria many times in their, in, well, not in their home, so to speak, but in a rented home. The famous home that he had had built had had been sold, of course, and so he didn't have access to that. But he he rather liked to be in the same area, so he would rent a place in the milieu that was familiar to them. It was, of course, Emmy, his wife, who managed to bring all his books and many of his other possessions to Britain after he had, you know traveled straight from Amsterdam to London after the Anschluss and he knew that he was not going to be going back and you know, her strong personality made that made it possible to actually in these difficult circumstances allow him to continue his his studies because he had his his books and his papers with him that was must have been really important certainly it, 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 to come into their home was simply to go back in time. It was a, a kind of Viennese milieu. I, I, I'm not competent to say, uh, uh, but there was an element of Art Nouveau about it, I thought. Uh, but she had all this beautiful furniture and his papers, as you say, and he loved to show us his manuscripts and his uh, scores, Mahler's annotations in the scores were uh, something he simply beamed over when he could lay this out and say, now Mahler did this and Mahler did that, whom he, Mahler whom he regarded so highly. But you're right, uh, I, I've never understood how Emmy could do it. Uh, Egon uh, was sent a wire in Amsterdam, don't come back, it, you not safe. And Emmy was there and yet within I'm not sure how, five, six months, she had convinced somebody, or somebody, I was told, that she had got false documents and had uh, uh, hoodwinked the Gestapo into letting her take this big van load of material uh, out of the country. I don't know how she did it, but uh, she was one who could do it. She had a very firm manner. And um, uh, it, was a, it was always a pleasure to experience this Viennese milieu in the middle of Oxford. There were, of course, some other Viennese emigres um, in, in, in Oxford or in Britain. Did you ever meet other emigres in their house or through them? I think the only one I met in their house was Hans Redlich. But I know that he was, he was in contact with Hans Gall. Um, Matthew Scheiber, I think, um, oh, Reisenstein, and I don't, I don't really know, uh, I didn't meet them, but of those who were already in England, I, I remember Hans Gall and Raedlich especially, but then there were always people visiting him from, from Vienna. Um, members of the uh, Vienna Philharmonic, for example, visited him and uh, Edward Melkus came uh, when he was writing the violin concerto and we met him also and uh, uh, that, that was one side. But the other side was that the, there were also guests from, from, from Denmark, from uh, those working on Byzantine music and the edition of Monumenta Musica Byzantina um, and we met them also. I understand that he really was always uh, an internationalist, really, in his um, uh, work as well. I mean, he was a very important um, figure in the 
International Society for Contemporary Music and also um, the International Society for Musicology, I believe. Especially the Contemporary Music Society, I think uh, he was quite proud of. Uh, I don't know um, what I can't think exactly of his activities in the International Musicological Society, but uh, undoubtedly he had had. At the time I knew him, he wasn't so active in lecturing and going to conferences. I don't think that interested him very much anymore, but he surely did at an earlier stage, if he had a chance. Now, when you think that the war took a big chunk out of that time, well, he went to America sometimes, to Dunbarton Oaks, uh, but again, that was part of the Byzantine uh, activity. But that, he had, he had uh, contacts with Byzantinists uh, everywhere, I suppose, but that was mainly at that time, it was in, um, in the United States, I think. And when they got Monumenta started, or when they were met in Copenhagen to start Monumenta, I think it was um, with academic support from influential people in the United States that helped bring it, give it financial backing. Well, it became part of the International Association of Academies. When you were there in the in the nineteen sixties with with him, um, were you aware of his legacy as a composer, uh, especially you know all the successes he had celebrated in? In, in Europe in the 1920s, uh, you know, because his, his legacy as a composer went a long way back. But were you aware of it? Of course we knew that he was a distinguished composer. And of course, if you went into his house, you saw posters from the opera performances and so on. One, one, one was reminded of it, that he had been something of quite, of, of significance. And we knew also that he had been um, associated with Schoenberg, that he had written the first biography or study of Schoenberg, so that we, we certainly knew about his role uh, in the um, musical world before he came to Oxford. But I think that's probably significant to us, to, to me at least. He was always an Austrian composer. We, we, that was that was something he had done. We were aware that he went on composing, but his prominence didn't come from performances in England, at least. And I don't think there was anyone who was tempted to regard him as an English composer. I think he was always an Austrian composer in England, just as his home was Austrian, I thought. I. I was perhaps a little bit unguarded once in, in, a, in a talk about him that I mentioned that he, he always, that he felt a, rather as an outsider. Now, I perhaps shouldn't have made a personal remark about him because Emmy afterwards, Emmy said, he never felt like an outsider. But I think he did because when he would write a le an important letter, for example, he would come at, with his letter in hand and he would always consult with the secretary in the faculty office before he sent it, that he had to make sure that it was correct and that then she would type it up and it would go off. He had this regular routine. At, but it was the outsider part, I think, was really because when you were with him, you were always aware that he that he was somebody else, that he was from another another world. Partly his age, of course, but also because the things we knew about him were so distinguished uh, so and so interesting to us because it was different, because it was Guido Adler and it was but the, all the composers from the International Society, he had met Ravel and he, had, he knew them all and uh, he had, his works were performed on them. But that was that chapter. He, as you very well know, he didn't really start his career as a symphonist until after the war. And uh, then, but we were hopeful, so to speak, uh, 
once in a while, once in a while, when it, it, there was at least particular one, particularly one occasion when one of the symphonies was to get a, a performance on the BBC, and uh, everyone was very eager to hear it and interested to hear it, but um, it was it was an event. It was not something that one could uh, that one took in one stride. And then uh, when uh, he was writing the violin concerto and Edward Melkos came and he consulted, oh, he was very excited during this period. He loved to have his Viennese musicians come to visit him and it gave him new inspiration to do, to, to write again. I, I wasn't, he, he, had, he had actually just finished the octet before I came, but the, the Viennese um, uh, ensemble came uh, to play, and uh, that was an event, and I happen to like that work very much, the octet, uh, I think. Is a... It's very characteristic of it, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, we performed it here at the, at the Royal College of Music just a few months ago, with oh. and, and our director, uh, Colin Lawson, who also actually knew Velez personally when he was a student in Oxford and played clarinet on his 85th birthday. He coached the, 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 the octet and uh, it was a really, for me, my first life uh, experience of the piece and also I agree with you. It's a, and it's so, it's so interesting that, he, you know, it was written for the Wiener octet, uh, but written in Oxford. And, yes. Um, so this, this, this connection between Vienna and Oxford through, I mean, literally the, their house, as you've described it, and the the, the 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 testimony that he could give of this period in musical history to you and uh, other colleagues and, and students in Oxford, I mean that would have been a, an incredible, you know, rich, serendipitous side effect of something that was, of course, very unfortunate for him that he had to leave Vienna in the first place, but of course he had this connection with Oxford long before. He actually settled there, and so there, it was. Yes, his connection to Oxford meant a lot to him. Uh, uh, for, he, he, as you know, he got his honorary doctorate in 1932, and I suppose, and I, I don't know, I, ha I haven't seen the Laudatio for it, but uh, I suppose that it was given to him as a scholar because of his Byzantine studies, because the Monumenta had just been founded the year before in 1931. Then he gets his doctorate in 1932. But to Egon, he said, I was the first Austrian composer since Haydn to get a doctorate. So he thought of himself getting it as Haydn's successor. Well, we, we smiled a little bit, but it was a, a sympathetic thing to, to think. And what I think is sometimes overlooked is that H.C. Collis got his doctorate at the same time, in the same ceremony in 1932, so that it was not an accident that when he needed help in 1938, it was Collis that could step in and offer him uh, some uh, help and, uh, um, yes, influence, certainly, but help uh, in bringing him to, uh, uh, to London. Because one of the first jobs, if you can call it that, that he had was working on, on the, the, the fourth gro edition, I th the third or fourth, of Grove that Hollis, Collis was uh, editing. But certainly, uh, uh, he maintained uh, this uh, enormous grat debt of gratitude to, uh, to Collis all his life, and Collis' his wife, too. And I believe that that extended beyond the 1938 thing, I think that Collis helped um, get uh, the rest of his family out. Uh, Magda was married by that time, but I think that Collis and his uh, wife had, uh, had a hand in getting them out too. Now you mentioned the symphonies and um, the, I mean there was a stylistic progression and, and change also in the in, in those symphonies that, you know, I think there were many references to, you know, Mahler perhaps, Bruckner, and, and that, that sort of early um, age of symphonic um, writing in, in, that he had, you know, absorbed. But then also he did bring in 
12 tone technique and um, you know much more um, edgy uh, ways of you know communicating as a musician as a composer and I just wonder if you if you saw those two sides of him um, in 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 real life as well as a as a composer and as a as a musician well yes I, I think one probably could now I I'm 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 not a, a very specialist with regard to his music because I've I've never tried to analyze them, but one 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 was certainly aware of his uh, his concept of a Viennese tradition, and that he identified himself with that. that he, I think that was very essential to him. His relationship to Schoenberg is problematic. I don't really understand it because he was himself, uh, he regarded, he was very proud of the fact that he was or, um, Schoenberg's first uh, private pupil and always made a point of that, that he was a pupil of Schoenberg and he was always absolutely loyal to Schoenberg. He uh, regarded him very highly and I never heard him say anything critical about him. I think the same is not true of Schoenberg. I think Schoenberg was a much more difficult person to uh, to associate with. But but uh, Egon Egon was loyal. But the thing that interested us was that he was not um, uh, he was not a, a disciple of Schoenberg in his own music. He he exercised a great deal of freedom uh, from the Schoenberg. A dictum and, a, and a, uh, Schoenberg's uh, own techniques, uh, theoretical techniques, which actually I I I, I rather liked. <laughs> I liked that side of him, his his independence of Schoenberg's uh, system. Now I know that later on, uh, as you say, he went through uh, stages of development. And that at, at some later point, he does experiment with um, serial uh, techniques, but I can't comment really very much on that. Robert Layton could have told you about that, but I, I, I'm not w very familiar with the uh, analytical details of his uh, later repertoire. I respected the fact that he could find his own way despite the strong influence of Schoenberg and Berg, but um, others can see more about that. So in terms of his, uh, his legacy as a composer, um, I'm just wondering what his migration and the fact that he was forced to leave Vienna, and, but also that he you know, found a very rich and you know, pleasant environment in, in many ways in Oxford, um, just thinking what kind of effect that would have had, in your opinion, about, on him as a composer, and if his later music, do you think, had any influences of his time in Britain? Perhaps the fact that his, um, the opera written in, for the Oxford Opera Society, Incognita, um, the fact that it was a comic opera on a English, with an English text, seems to me entirely different from Alcestis and the, the Greek mytho mythological text that had been um, cultivated together with Hugo von Hofmannsthal. And, uh, I, I, it seems to me that it occupies, a, it exists in a different world for him. He certainly liked Oxford. He certainly was grateful to Oxford. He was particularly, well, but he was well treated too because because he was who he was and because he was a nice man. The, uh, uh, Walter Oakeshott, for example, the, the principal at his college, at Lincoln College, was extremely uh, accommodating to all his wishes and everything. And the college, I suppose with reference to the, the portrait of Kokoschka that he had had to sell at one point, uh, the, the, they commissioned a new portrait of him, and uh, I think these things, these attentions, of course, meant a lot to him. Uh, he was a little bit childish, almost, with when people 
would make a fuss about him. And uh, I think that too refers back to the time when that was the normal pattern of his life in Vienna. But in, in England, he, he, he felt he was something, he was outside of his natural habitat. And when people paid attention to him, he, he appreciated it. And maybe even dri my driving him to the faculty every morning he appreciates, but I don't know. We simply got along very well together from the, from the start. Uh, also, it was, it, 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 he, I learned a lot about, I'm not a Byzantinist myself, and uh, I'm, he, I, I picked up a lot about his work in, as a Byzantinist and about Monumenta and about Monumenta's history, which has had an effect on my career because when Strunk retired and Glenn after him, suddenly there was nobody to take over. And Monumenta was in a bit of a crisis, and I was talked into taking it on as director of Monumenta, which I did for 25 years nearly, or 21 years, maybe, I don't know. But uh, even though it's, it was not my own research field, somebody had to keep it going, and I kept it going because of my dedication to Egon. So if he had such warm feelings for Britain, and he was so appreciative of it. Do you think that as a composer, he wanted to connect with Britain through his music as well? Well, it's not apparent to me in the music. Uh, I, I, I've, I don't not I don't see. I don't notice any any change of national character in the music, with the possible exception of incognita, which I, I don't know incognita very well, but uh, um, it, uh, he, he, he liked it himself, and he liked the fact that he had worked with an English libretto at that point. But I, 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 in the symphonies, I'm not aware of, uh, he, though he does call one symphony well, an English symphony. symphony. Is called yeah, the the English. second symphony, yes. Do you know if that may have, that was his um, title? That I don't know, I no. don't know. Um, but uh, of course, when he started to write symphonies again, I suppose he wanted to call one of them an English symphony, just as Perry did, I think, at one point. He certainly felt a, a steep uh, a debt of gratitude to the fact that he was in England at all, that he had survived. But uh, I'm pretty sure that his, both as a scholar and as a composer, I'm pretty sure that he felt he was continuing the tradition from Austria. It's, it's interesting though to think of it. He belonged to that generation where he had, uh, he had been formed by a very strong tradition. At a later stage, I, I once pre prepared the choir for a, a concert for Dokshinanyi. And the concert had the Te Deum by Bruckner and the Alto Rhapsody by Brahms, both of whom Dokshinanyi had known. And it was a strange experience, a moving experience to be present, to, to see him work with this music from a milieu of which he had this personal connection. Well, I felt the same with Egon, that he, he had known Adler, and he, he may not have known Bruckner, but he certainly was in the wake of Bruckner. Uh, uh, and, and, and he had, of course, he had known Schoenberg and, uh, and many others. But, um, oh yes, there was another one that uh, he was always uh, this is, uh, came as a bit of a surprise, but he, he was always very grateful and very fond of Franz Lehár. He had been at the first performance of The Merry Widow, I think, but the thing was, I think, that he had contact with, uh, in his role in the um, Composer Society in Vienna, that he had often had uh, contact with Lehar, but the particular thing was that he told me that Lehar's branch, the, the 
uh, entertainment branch of the Composer Society was the only side that made any money. And they didn't have any money in the serious side, but they wanted to give a, 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 give a grant of money. Well, he wanted to get, give a grant of money to, to Anton von Webern. And they said, well, let's ask uh, Lehar. And Lehar uh, gave it some thought and said, yes, he'll, he'll put up money for that. And Egon said he always had a high regard for Lehar, that he would ha take his money and give it to Webern. And uh, <laughs> yeah, he liked that. And, but that was a, a, a very attractive side of, uh, uh, he, he liked Strauss and he liked the entertainment music of Vienna as well as the serious music of Vienna. There was a conference um, about Welles in Graz, and you, there was this book published um, in Studien zur Wertungsforschung, um, edited by Otto Coleridge. And you wrote a very beautiful article about uh, Welles's time in Oxford here. And what I found very interesting was that you conclude this article with the sentence, uh, with this sentence that saying, perhaps. His success was the greater because he had arrived at a clearer conception of who he was in a foreign country than he would have done among his own. Well, I, I, I hardly remember having written it, but I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not disappointed with the idea because I, I think that has maybe expresses a, much of what I've been trying to say uh, in our discussion so far, that Egon, I think, accepted the fact that he was, uh, uh, um, in his deep roots, he was an Austrian composer, and he had learned to live with that in, in England, I think. It, and it didn't hurt. It, he didn't feel disappointed by it, but I think he might have thought when he came, how old was he? He was 50 or something when he uh, came to England. And he might have thought that in his creative work, he could become part of a, 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 an English milieu, which I don't think was the case. I, I, I don't want to do him an injustice, but I don't think it was the case. But he may have learned that it was not a bad thing to continue being an Austrian, even though he was, so to speak, in exile. And the exile element remained because when when his papers were to be disposed of he arranged or it was arranged that they went not to the british library but to the national library in, in vienna and when he died he was well he was first buried in 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 oxford but he was then his emmy arranged for him to be moved to uh, the Friedhof in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Vienna, and she herself moved back to Vienna. She didn't, her life had not been so shaped that she had her normal, natural uh, milieu in Oxford, but she moved back to Vienna, where you might wonder, what, what did she go back to? Because it was so many years since they had lived there. But she did, and I visited her there, and she was she thrived. She was uh, such a lovely lady, and she, well, it was very nice. She had one daughter who was in Vienna at that time, uh, Liesel, but the other, the fir the older daughter was actually in England, uh, Magda, and one might have thought that Magda had uh, had grand had children, and uh, that uh, she might have stayed in England where her grandchildren were. Liesel didn't have children, and uh, um, yet uh, she chose to return to Vienna. Pro perhaps language, that's always a problem. And I, I think where she could speak German and uh, or Austrian, what do you like? But um, I think also she felt that that was hers and Egon's uh, natural habitat. But of course, his position in the university was not available to him again after the war. Um, and do you think that he was, uh, well, that, that he was unhappy about that and disappointed about it? Quite sure that he, he was disappointed, but 
not only disappointed, I, now I, 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 I don't want to get into uh, or attribute any politics to him, but he um, was very critical of the man who got the position that would have been his. Yes, I, I, I think he certainly expected to be asked back. And I think that he felt a, a certain sense of betrayal that he wasn't asked back. And he was very critical of the man who, yeah, we don't need to mention, but yeah. who was there. And, um, and at the, as I said, he, at the same time, he met, he was very, he was accommodated in every respect in Oxford. It was just that he was himself Viennese. I think that was the essence of it. But he, he, they made life, his life was comfortable in Oxford. Now, in terms of the, the legacy and, and the music and how it lives on, I mean, we've performed quite a bit of Veles uh, within this project about music and migration here in the last few years. And it has really appealed to uh, especially younger musicians as well. And, and there is something, I would say, quite spiritual about it. There's something that's, that speaks very immediately to people. And the, the earlier works as well, which are often you know, very expansive and they can be very slow moving uh, works as well. I mean, in the, in the chamber with the piano music, we just um, uh, recorded the uh, fünf, uh, so the, the, the very early uh, piano pieces, Der Abend, uh, which are really kind of Debussy, you know, um, in, inspired. Yeah. And then the Klavierstücke much later in the, from the 1950s, which, you know, bear elements of Schoenberg's uh, style, but at the same time also create very clearly relatable atmospheres for people to, to, to connect with. And for me, that is not necessarily particularly Austrian in such in such a way. I mean, I know that there is a there's a lot of so, but there is something individual that for me in in Bellis's music that transcends his nationality, and that perhaps you know when it goes into the symphonies, especially, you know, may have also great appeal to international audiences, and may benefit from not just being seen as Austrian music that was displaced, so to speak. The, what, what I think is, is essential in, in, in everyone is that there is the sense of humanity uh, throughout his, his work. Extremely impatient over Stockhausen. He simply couldn't see anything uh, worthwhile in, in Stockhausen. Uh, that it was, in fact, he, he, and in fact his word was, it, it's, it's, it's inhuman music. Uh, he, uh, especially the, the, rec the record, the, um, what do you call it, uh, tape recorder music that Stockhausen did. I, I attended a lecture demonstration by Stockhausen with him once, and he shook his head and said, it, it, it has nothing to do with human beings. And, and, and your, your description of his repertoire as being always with an element of humanity in it, I think is very, very striking, I think very right. And that uh, um, is one of the problems, it seems to me, when uh, he uh, experiments with serialism, that um, uh, I think you once mentioned, uh, is, is there a certain eclecticism in his music, but Yes, in, in, in this sense that I, I think he did like to try it on. He liked to do a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And so there's not, a, 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 not a, an absolutely consistent style for, for him. He, he, of course, he lived a long time and he covered a lot of, uh, he lived in a lot of environments. So that, that's not surprising. But uh, I think there's always, there's always a certain warmth in what he has, and a, a certain, and I, <laughs> I don't know, but I think that uh, that will save him in the long run. Well, I'm I'm sure of that too, and in in some ways the the eclecticism, and you know, uh, it's 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 almost something that a composer shouldn't be eclectic because. They, they, they're fake, you know, they're taking on, they're stealing things from, but that's, of course, also a, a false 
thought, I think, because he 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 knew about all this music. He knew about all these styles and those Baroque music so deeply also part of his personality as a scholar yes. and then of course he can refer to these things very freely and why shouldn't he yes. and that doesn't make him uh, an inauthentic composer yes. and as you say that the humanity that is there throughout and the warmth that is there throughout brings that together um, and so I hope that people will you know see this in the future. I'm glad you mentioned that, the, the Baroque uh, connection, because uh, we hadn't mentioned that before, that his, his research, original research, was, was uh, in, quite in, in the court music in, in, in Vienna, quite a different thing, uh, the court music of the 18th century, and that, when, uh, and that he took time from his Byzantine studies to write a book on Fuchs also, and, which he did actually during our, the time we knew him, and everybody was very happy because Fuchs, everybody talked about Fuchs, but nobody knew anything about him. But uh, Egon came up with this, um, the same thing has happened actually with uh, Rudolf Lotzinger, who uh, has uh, done a, a, a big study of uh, Fuchs in recent years since then. But, but um, uh, the, uh, the Baroque element that shows up perhaps in, uh, maybe there's a touch of that in, in Cognita too, with the environment that they create there. But uh, I'm glad you mentioned uh, that because that, one of his big, pro big major projects, I suppose, and you were talking about, you asked about his position in the faculty, that when the new Oxford history was to be written, the big chapter on Mozart and Haydn and the Viennese classicists, that was originally to be done by uh, Jens Peter Larsen, in, in, uh, the Haydn specialist in, in, in Copenhagen. But Jens Peter had a very hard time getting this done, and in fact he couldn't get it done. It, it, the pages didn't flow, and he didn't and the book was waiting to go to press, and it was waiting, and it was waiting, and Jens Peter wasn't ready. So it ended up being written by Egon and uh, Fred Sternfeld, uh, who had been his pupil in Vienna at, 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 before the war. And uh, these two did the chapter that Jens Peter should have done. And it, I, it, 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 people might think, oh, Egon Velis, that Byzantinist, what does he know about that? But he knew a great deal about that. He, he, this, this was not only the period he knew, but it was the milieu. The, he once said that he, what was it he said? He said he had, he, he studied uh, under the Habsburgs and he was appointed professor by the little corporal or something, he said. I don't know, it, 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 that's not quite right. But he, he did distinguish between before and after the war, the First World War. No, I, 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 I haven't quoted him at all correctly, but he, he did like the fact that he had this, this Habsburg connection first. Now, to conclude, I would love to get a sense of how you think back now um, did Veles and your friendship with Veles and the fact that you worked parallel with each other as colleagues for quite a few years, how that sort of affected your life after that? And you, of course, then we went to live in Denmark and you know had a very eminent career in musicology yourself. I mean, I think there are at least over 300 articles that I found in somewhere or references. Uh, so, I mean, and so how, what did you take in your onward career from this time with Veles? The short answer is that I, I, I took on responsibility for Monumenta Musica Resettine because somebody had to do it. And because with these years with Egon, I had acquired quite a backlog from that period. And when, much of the documentation of Monumenta that has taken place since then, I've been able to have a hand in. I've been able to represent Egon uh, and what Egon said and what Egon did in the historical documentation of the period. That's, that's one thing. Otherwise, uh, from, a, from a 
research or a scholarly point of view, I don't suppose I inherited very much except, except I hope, integrity, because I, I, he, he was a man who in, in inspired uh, integrity. He, you knew that uh, some things were important and that uh, academic truth was one of them. That he, he, yeah, well, I would like to think at least that um, I had some of that uh, inheritance from him, but uh, from a, a factual point of view, I don't think I learned I don't think I learned very much, except um, a general, a general feeling for history. I think a feeling of, of an environment that has been been useful from time to time when you want to get yourself into the into a period into a study. But otherwise, uh, as 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 you know, I, I've not I've not been one of his pupils. I've not been. Uh, I, maybe I'm, maybe I've been one of his disciples, but that has not that has been more of a of a spiritual kind than anything else. I suppose. S speaking of which, he was of course a very religious man, and his um, his his um, um, devotion to the Catholic Church was 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 very very sincere and very. Uh, very effective, uh, very, very affecting, I think. Well, I mean, I find that he, he converted, um, he, he, he had a Jewish background, but then converted to Catholicism. It's funny, the, the Jewish background was never emphasized uh, in my acquaintance with him. Um, he, in fact, when when Emmy told me once, said, yes, but when Egon was uh, on the wanted list in Vienna, it wasn't it wasn't as a Jew; it was as, as a royalist. It was because he he was in favor of a restoration of the Habsburg uh, monarchy, and that they were after him for. Well, whether that was the whole truth or not, I don't know. But he 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 uh, he converted first to Lutheranism. He he was. Uh, uh, I don't know whether he came under the influence of, there was a charismatic uh, Lutheran pastor in, in the faculty of the university at that time. And uh, Magda, was, Magda was baptized at birth and Emmy was baptized at exactly the, at the same time. This religious side of him, I think, is somehow present in the music. I, I don't know how I can evidence that, but I certainly, you know, feel a deep spiritual um, sincerity in, in in his music, and that's uh, I think, you know, clearly connected to to his uh, religion. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, well, I, I, his conversion to Catholicism, I think, was in the thirties, uh, thirty-three or something. I don't know exactly, but um, and that also, I, I'm I'm sure was. Um, a, a, a particular moment in history for in in Austria for it uh, affected many, but um, I don't know. He then he wrote a a, a fine mass uh, too, and it was in sixty one. I think it was at least I was there at the, uh, when it happened when he received the news that he was um, going to be knighted by the Pope, and that was important to him too. That, that meant a lot. And his his uh, uh, some many of his associates were from the uh, Catholic um, colleges uh, in in Oxford too at that time. Otherwise, I don't know. Uh, he 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 never made an exhibition of it, or he never he never voluntarily talked about it. But one just knew that he was uh, quite sincere about well, very sincere about his beliefs. So his his presence in Oxford really was he touched so many lives in Britain, didn't he? As a as a teacher, as a colleague, and also through his music. And people do have some interest in it now, and will I think it will continue to be interesting to people here as well as, uh, of course, in in Austria and other parts of the world. Thank you, John. It's been a great pleasure to talk to you and uh, thank you for sharing your memories and thank you for coming to the Royal College today. It was very lucky for us that you uh, are in London at the moment and you could make the time to 
come here. I, I hope I've been able to remember the right things <laughs> to your questions. It, it's, a, it, it's a great pleasure actually to, to think back and to remember. These things meant as much to me as they did to Aegon, I think, and uh, I, I'm very, very happy to be able to talk about my old friend. Thank you very much.